Welcome to the Endless Knot Podcast. Where the more we know, the more we want to find out. Tracing serendipitous connections through our lives and across disciplines. Hi, I'm Avon. And I'm Mark. And today we're going to be talking about Star Wars. So timely. We are keeping to our tradition of being way behind the curve and responding to things after giving them months to years to mellow. We were just the first to start flattening curves. (laughs) We flattened this one out really well. (laughs) So today we're going to talk about the last of the sequel trilogy, The Rise of Skywalker. Yes. And, you know... We're mostly just going to talk about the movie, but we'll try to interject some classical and medieval thoughts into it as well. (laughs) We bring this up because it did just, well, I say just, it's not even all that just, but (laughs) it came out onto home media and we just watched it. We watched it. Don't make us sound like people who don't go to We saw it in the theater, (laughs) but we just watched it on home media for For the the first first time. time. At home. Yeah. Yeah. So it's in our thoughts. And since we did the, we've done podcasts on a couple of previous movies, Last Jedi, maybe. I don't think we did The Last Jedi. We did The Force Awakens. That's right. And we did um, Rogue Rogue One. One. That's right. Not The Last Jedi. So we just thought that would be a fun topic. And And I'm going to be honest with you. I kind of came up with this idea because we needed to come up with a topic and we were sort of short on time to do a lot of research. (laughs) This seemed, watching a, what is it, about a three hour movie? That we had to watch anyway because with our kids, it was Friday night, yeah. It seemed relatively easy. And the other slightly less lazy and self-centered reason was that as things continue in the outside world in, you can't see, but I'm waving my hands in a gesture of that Mm-hmm. You know, we considered again, maybe doing an episode on disease words, and we might still do that. Let us know if you want to hear a podcast episode from us on plague and disease and so Or forth. about theories of disease in the ancient and medieval world. Yeah. Theories of... Something along Or those words lines. for disease. We, we could do that. And we've considered it. But in many ways, distraction is what I'm looking for. <laughs> and I feel like I can't be quite alone on that. So... That's really what we're going to talk about. Also, I mean, there are no new movies to report on now yeah, because that's true. no one's seeing any new <laughs> movies because there are no new movies. Yeah. So we can't we can't go to the theater and see the new releases. So why not? All right. So before we get to that, just one little piece. Uh, we really want to say thank you to a new Patreon supporter, Dan B., who became a supporter last month. Thanks, Dan. Anyone who'd like to join in and become a supporter as well. Please go to patreon.com, The Endless Knot. However, we continue to be not charging people. I'm going to admit, however, I forgot to turn off the charging for May. And so you were charged for the first of May. Turns out you have to turn them off every month. Yeah, you have to do it every month and you can't do it until the new month. And while March was the longest month that has ever happened and was about six years long, April went by so fast that I genuinely (laughs) didn't even realize it was May until a couple days in. So I apologize for that. I know I said I would give you warning before we turned it back on and I didn't. So I really am very sorry about that. That said, I have paused it for June. June 1st, you won't be charged. And if we decide not to pause it for July, we will announce it on Patreon and on social media. Sorry. But I do think, and we were just talking about this, before we turn things back on again, we want to kind of revamp the the tears, the and, tears and all of that. The rewards of it. So if anybody has any suggestions for rewards, I'm very torn about rewards and how to do them. A lot you, of people don't seem to be interested in them. Yeah. So if you have thoughts about what you would like us to do or how you would like to organize that, please feel free to let us know because I'm a little bit at sea about how to do that. I know that myself as a supporter of other creators, I tend to just want to give them money and don't care what I get for it. Mm -hmm. But I don't want to assume that's what everyone else thinks. And I'd like to hear about that if if you have an opinion. And once again, we want to mention Lyceum, a new platform that we are part of. And it's all about educational podcasts. Mm -hmm. So podcasts specifically on educational topics. The advantage of this is it gives you 
better signal to noise ratio for those of you who like us are really particularly interested in, in all the great educational podcasts there are out there. So it's, it's a lot easier to find podcasts that you're interested in. Mm -hmm. It's Um, good search. And it's, there's a lot of curated lists on particular topics or approaches to things. So they've done the sort of first layer of searching for you. Yeah. And there are all kinds of other cool features on this platform. There's more opportunities to interact with podcasters and have discussions on the platform. So check it out. It's at lyceum.fm. Right now, most of the functionalities are on only on apps, not on the desktop, but it's very much just still in beta. So they're going to be rolling a bunch of stuff out over the next little while. So if you, if you go to that website, there will be a link there to get to the app and you can download it to your mobile device and proceed from there. Mm -hmm. So join us over on Lyceum. All right. Last thing before we get going, talking about Star Wars is a Star Wars cocktail. Yeah. And by way of this, we want to mention a book that I don't think we've ever mentioned before. No, I don't think so. Though we've been quite enjoying it. Since Christmas. Since Christmas. Yeah. Which now is like years ago, <laughs> I'm pretty sure. Yeah. So this cocktail recipe, which is called a photon fizzle, and is, let me see if I, what it says it talks about. It's a carbonated concoction from diners at core worlds like Coruscant back in the days of the Galactic Republic. That's in the write-up about it. Is in It's a recipe in a book called Star Wars Galaxy's Edge, the official Black Spire Outpost Cookbook. And we were given this by my sister and her partner for Christmas. Mm -hmm. And it's a cookbook. And unlike most novelty cookbooks, which tend to be not very good. Like the recipes are not very good. They can be fun, but not. You know, they often just throw a bit of food coloring in and otherwise it's not really well thought out. Or it's bad. Like it's it's made to be funny and therefore is not actually tasty or interesting. Yeah. 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 This the recipes, with the very, very few exceptions of a couple of things that just didn't work out perfectly, every recipe we've made from it, we've made most of the recipes now, mm-hmm. uh, has been genuinely delicious. Mm-hmm. And, and different. And many of them have been things that wouldn't have occurred to me mm-hmm. as ideas for combining different tastes or textures or... Methods of cooking. Methods of even. cooking, yeah. Just a, bread with mushrooms and curry paste and soy sauce in the dough that is like really good. And I was a hundred percent sure it would a not work and B wouldn't taste good. And, and it's one great. With, there's one with bread and the meat on a skewer and yeah. you cook the bread, a bread on the dough skewer. that you wind around meatballs on a skewer and you cook. And again, hundred percent convinced not the bread wasn't going to cook right. Meat wasn't going to cook right. Wasn't going to be good. It all worked out perfectly. It was really good. Yeah. So. We would recommend this book, is Mm. what we're trying to say. We are not sponsored by this book (laughs) or by Star Wars, but we really like it. And it has a series, a set of cocktails at the back. So this Photon Fizzle has, it has has boba pearls, which are those tapioca pearls that are in bubble tea. And you make a batch of those. We had to order those way back. And then you soak them in a syrup that you've already made that they call a Dagobah slug syrup. That is ginger and rosemary sugar syrup with some green food coloring. So you soak, you make the pearls, then you soak them in that syrup. And then you make the cocktail with a little bit of that syrup, the pearls, gin, lime, and then top with ginger beer. And so the cocktail has is ginger beer, lime, and gin, and this ginger and rosemary syrup. And then it has these tapioca pearls, Mm -hmm. that taste of ginger and our green, floating in the bottom. It's really good. Yeah. And I'd never thought of putting gin in ginger beer. That's a a new combination. So Yeah. So we've made it before. This isn't new to us, but cheers. Cheers. It's really tasty. It's a light and refreshing drink. I mean, not that light. It's got three ounces of gin in it. But Mm -hmm. because of the ginger beer, it doesn't feel so heavy. Uh, It's sweet, but not, but the ginger really cuts through it. Mm -hmm. in the lime and uh, then you end up with pearls and the only drawback is that we have not been able to find a good straw like those bubble tea straws which of course are probably disposable so well the one in this picture is metal they have a metal one so i don't uh, know if you can get metal ones i've seen smoothie straws but they're not big enough for these Mm. i don't think they'd be big enough so that's the only drawback that you kind of have anyone knows where to get 
big metal, metal straws. bubble tea straws. Mm -hmm. Yeah, let, let us know. Anyway, so that's our little plug for that book. And it was, you know, instead of having to find not very good Star Wars cocktails, mm -hmm. we've actually got good tasty. Yeah. There's a number of other ones, including a, a liqueur that I made. That um, a lavender liqueur that they give a recipe for that I made a few um, months ago now, and I still have in the fridge, and it's purple and really quite tasty. I had a drink with that earlier. Yeah, so we actually had to decide which cocktail to make because there's several that are really good. Mm -hmm. Yeah. All right, so there'll be a picture of that on the blog. Okay, enough preamble. So now we're on to the amble. Yes, now time to amble. Hmm. Rise of Skywalker. Obviously, going to be spoilers. Can't really imagine that anyone who could be possibly interested in watching the movie hasn't watched the movie already. But if you are one of those few, pause now. <laughs> go watch the movie. Go watch the movie. It's available for home media, so you can go mm -hmm. watch it on Disney+. Plus. Then come back. Then come back. Or if you have no interest in watching the movie at all, we'll try to be interesting in talking about it. <laughs> to say, we'll, we'll try to explain what we're talking about so that you can have some idea what we're going on about. So this, of course, is the last of a trilogy, a trilogy that was set after the original trilogy and is the third piece of a So it's the last non of, of a trilogy of trilogies. Yes. Yeah. The third, tri third movie of the third trilogy of the entire saga. saga. Yeah. And was very, you know, heavily signaled as being the end, mm -hmm. the wrapping up, the culmination. My thoughts mostly are sort of, I, I've jotted down a bunch of stuff about connections to ancient epic and things. It's not a terribly coherent set of thoughts. Do you have any sort of overall discussions you'd like to, well, things you'd like to say? What I wrote down is I have a bunch of things that I want to say about how I took the films just as films themselves, first of all, mm -hmm. and how I think, you know, where I think it works and where I think it doesn't work and how it all fits together. And then I have a series of questions about the film and the entire saga in relation to medieval and in particular Norse literary genres. Right, like family sagas. Mm -hmm. Okay, so really, really briefly, what's the plot of the movie? <laughs> Do you remember? I is this one of the criticisms? <laughs> and I think this is one of the criticisms <laughs> because there's a whole lot going on in some ways, not a lot happens, but in a lot of ways, it's trying to do, it's trying to tie finish, up a, tie up of, a bunch of, of loose ends. So the instigating yeah. event is a message gets sent out across the galaxy that seems to be from the emperor, who we all thought was dead due to Ewoks back in 1983. Yeah. Ewoks with sticks. So at the end of the last movie... They all just barely manage to escape in their their only remaining ship, which is the Millennium Falcon, and the the number of of oh yeah right rebels, right. After, but not rebels, after the salt, uh, alliance the, or whatever they're the now salt called. Plane yeah. Battle, yeah, and th so it's a small enough group that can, that they can, can all fit kind of the fit into the Millennium Falcon, and basically their whole movement has been almost wiped out, but they still have hope. Yeah, because Leia gave them hope. Yes. And there's this this other thing that people will remember what they did and right. it, will, it will be the spark that, that lights, lights the flame. And, and, kind of right. and then somehow by the next, so the beginning of this movie, they do have another base mm -hmm. and a bunch of people somehow there. Somehow they've managed to build up at least some more resources. So we see, we see Ray training. Yes. With Leia. Yes. Who has become more and more a figure who apparently did Jedi training, mm -hmm. which is fine, but like. They didn't reveal that um, in the first two movies mm -hmm. of the trilogy, mm -hmm. so. But now we're, we're told that she's done, and it becomes clear over the movie that she's done training. So she's doing training with with Leia. The boys are out. Getting information. Right. They're doing a run, trying to get in, because there's a spy, there's a in spy who's going to give them information. In the First so, Order. and So they get the information, and they come back, and then the clock is started when they get back. Mm -hmm. We're told... The emperor is alive somehow, maybe a clone, not clear. And he has been gathering a huge fleet that nobody knew anything about. This is not the first order. This is the last order. Mm -hmm. There's no middle order. And it's the disorder. 
it's being collected on some place, but we don't know where. And we have 16 hours, we're told, until they will be fully Blurred powered me. up and they and every ship has the power of a Death Star, essentially. They were each a planet killer. And they're hidden somewhere that no one knows where it is. They're known yet. The 16 hour thing drives me bananas. I, d- <laughs> I mean, I, I don't like that in the original trilogy either. You no, know, they do everything in like a day. Mm-hmm. And it doesn't make any sense. And I don't understand why it needs to be so fast. Mm -hmm. Uh, And apparently no one in Star Wars ever sleeps. Ever. Well, I guess you can stay awake for 16 hours. Yeah, I know. But it is only 16 hours. If it is only 16 (laughs) hours. But like they were all awake when they found out there were 16 hours to go. So Mm -hmm. they've presumably been awake at least a couple of hours already. And Mm -hmm. how like smart are you at the end of six? Like why? Why did it have to be 16 hours? Why can't it be two days? It does seem a bit of kind of artificial trying to ramp up the tension yeah. or something. But like two days would also work. Two mm-hmm. days would be obviously not enough time to gather our coalition and find mm-hmm. these people. Like, you know, you could have a week and it still wouldn't be enough time. So anyway, whatever. Minor but, minor quibble. It just, I don't get why you need to do that. Except to parallel the ridiculously short time in which things happen. Yeah. In the first movie. So what they have to do is they have to find this place. And how are they going to do it? There's apparently, there's sort of clues to how to well, find Well, there are it. these Wayfinders. Sith artifacts that supposedly have the, have the information yes. about how to get there. So they have to go track those down and they go to different places. And I've already forgotten why they end up going to the places they go to. Not important. They go to a bunch of places to collect these things up. They have to find them. They have to find the people. Then they find the thing. They don't know what it says. So then they have to find a dagger and they don't know what the dagger says. So then they have to find a person to interpret the dagger. You know, like it's a series of challenges, uh-huh. right? Along the way, they fight over and over again with Ben Solo, with Kylo Ren. Mm -hmm. And then they end up in this place where the Death Star crashed. And then there's a big confrontation between Rey and Ben, or Kylo Ren, to which Finn also goes totally pointlessly. He does nothing. No. He risks his life getting out there. He's just there to see her go away, I guess, at the point. He does nothing. He's just... It's nothing. I don't understand it. And then she leaves to yes. because she thinks she because she knows where to go now. Well, no, so she heads she off. Go, she goes. She goes in frustration or something and goes back to right. Luke's she planet. goes back to Luke's planet where she then talks to Luke. And Luke Force says, Coast. everything I said in the last movie, I was wrong about. Yeah, you should totally be a Jedi. And then he raises in my favorite scene in the movie, to be mm. fair. He raises the his flyer out of the water and then he gives any smirks about it. And I love it. I have that. I'm like a hundred percent behind that scene because it's the swamp scene. But of course that scene was just fan service. Oh, and I was there for it. (laughs) Totally there for it. And then Ray gets in that and knows where to go, sends the information to the fleet. So the fleet is all going to follow her, but the fleet is tiny. So they're all going to follow her and they need to like, and apparently the first, the last order of ships take a long time to take off. No, they, do they follow her or is it? No, no they follow her because she, she sends them the information. She sends them the, tr- the oh, trace right. back okay. to right. R2-D2 or whatever. So they follow her and apparently the exciting, important plot twist is that it takes them like three hours to take off. The ships reaching the atmosphere is really slow. So they, they have time to get there and destroy the ships before they hit the atmosphere and then they'll be able to save the galaxy. They arrive and then there's a big fight between Rey and Kylo Ren, who's now turned good because he had a big chat with his dad, who was dead. And so they have a fight against the newly resurgent emperor, who's, I guess, a clone. But they're a dyad in the force. We don't know what that means, but it's important, apparently. And then they fight. Meanwhile, and this is the, the standard Star Wars parallel, right? There's the, four, the the fight going on between the powers of the Jedi and the Sith while there's a big firefight going on in the sky, which I'm fine with. Like, that's that's standard Star Wars stuff. And it's a pretty good firefight, actually. Mm-hmm. I quite like it. There's some really interesting things goes on. And then Rey dies. Kylo Ren brings her back. It's not clear how. Four ceiling. Diet of the Force stuff. Know. She dies in killing the Emperor. Yes. She kills the Emperor. She dies. Kylo Ren brings her back, but then he dies. But she doesn't bring him back. And then 
everybody's rescued and everybody's good. And that's the end. Right. I'm trying to remember if there's a coda. Is there a coda? Well, she goes to Tatooine. That's right. She goes back to Cat Tatooine and she takes the name of Skywalker. Yes. That's right. So she buries all of their lightsabers, which is like a renunciation of the Jedi. But she's But she also takes own. the name Skywalker, mm -hmm. which seems like a continuation of the Jedi. Mm -hmm. And that's the movie. So everybody who watched the movie is now like, yes, thank you for summarizing this really badly. <laughs> <laughs> But for those of you who didn't or but have some idea of the Star Wars movie or haven't watched it in a long time, because as I said, I've only watched it last week and I've already lost track of a bunch of stuff. That's just to give you a sense of what we're going to be talking about. So what are your overall thoughts about how it fits into the franchise? All right. Well, first of all, let's talk about the sequel trilogy and how it fits into that. Mm -hmm. So episodes seven and eight went in very different directions. And I don't think there's any denying that, right? Yeah, yeah. They had very different ideas about what they were doing. Yeah. And I think they were both excellent films. Yeah, I agree. They, they didn't mesh very well. No. But they were good movies. So how do you make a third film to wrap both of those up? And right? all of the threads from all the previous stuff, but yeah. Yeah. So. And by the way, we know that lots of people have different opinions about all of these movies. That's fine. Yeah. We liked them, the, the first two. You don't have to. But there's really divided opinions about this. Not going to address that. Yeah. So in the end, I think episode nine had too much to cover. It mostly focuses on picking up stuff from episode seven. Right. Not eight. It kind of skips eight. a lot of what's it's, in eight. It drops a lot of the themes that were brought up in eight. Mm -hmm. Though the one theme that is continuing continued throughout, I guess, all three films and, you know, I guess arguably through all well, nine films is the theme of family. Though, as far as I can tell, it completely reverses, as far as I can feel, it reverses course on what family means. Yes. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So, I mean, there, there are all these questions that get asked mm -hmm. and they're not even necessarily answered. So do family lines, as in genealogical yeah. the, family do, lines, do they matter yeah, yeah are familial connections important in mm -hmm. some way mm -hmm. and sort of more broadly are personal emotional connections good or bad is attachment right good or bad right. which is which is a question that to be fair is really confused in the first trilogy and, and then more confused in the prequels mm -hmm. and now is confused like it's, yeah. there is no there's a, a real problem with a consistent answer to that. Mm -hmm. Then there's another theme that's not really there in the original trilogy as much, though it, I, it is sort of there. It is sort of there, but it's much more muted. This theme of slavery, it's yeah. very much there in the prequels. Yes. And well, it, a prequel. A prequel, but it gets sort of yeah. opened up from just the specific question of slavery to a broader question about capitalism. Yeah. And, and that's and how it exploitation. gets exploitation yeah. and so forth. And that gets more sort of broadly kind of covered in, in the, the rest of the prequels. And it comes up again in a big way in episode eight. So they finally come back to this, yeah. this question in episode eight. And it looks like, okay, this is the big payoff. Mm -hmm. right? And then? And then they drop it completely. Yeah. Yeah. So it's not there at all, as far as I can tell, in episode nine. The only place I can see it at all is in the little bits of discussion between Finn and the other woman who was a stormtrooper. Storm yeah. Not stormtrooper. They were first, first order troopers or whatever, trooper, whatever those yeah. were. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I'm, I'm not like, I'm not disagreeing with you. I'm just trying to think if there's anything, there is that little bit of the way they were stolen as children. They were slaves in meaningful ways and they rebelled. Mm hmm. I could go down a rabbit hole of talking about slave rebellions like Sicily because they're on their mm -hmm. own isolated world. They managed to, you know, do it like, or they're mm -hmm. Haiti, right? Like, and I wouldn't be surprised if somebody somewhere was in writing it or staging it was thinking a little bit of like Haiti, the only su successful slave right. Re rebellion, right? Mm -hmm. There's like some parallel I can sort of see, but I can imagine a version of that movie where that was a bigger storyline. But in what we actually get, mm -hmm. you have to fill mm -hmm. most of that in with headcanon. It's not really there. There's and, just and a little maybe bit maybe there was more of that in some stage of the script that then just yeah. had to get cut and out. And the other piece, the other piece long. is the way they treat C-3PO. Right. 
wiping of his memory, the risking of his life. Does he get a choice? And- which he doesn't. Mm-hmm. But like, but there's no coherent moral there. No. Because they do it. Mm-hmm. The, our heroes mm-hmm. do it to him. And then they play his trauma for laughs. Mm-hmm. And then he's restored so it's all okay. So in the same way that in the original series, the droids and their slavery was played for laughs. You know, there was no moral weight given to that question of these seem to be sentient beings. What the hell are you doing with them? Never got fully explored. And the only place that they're ever treated even a little bit better is in the prequels, specifically by Anakin. Mm -hmm. And not just Anakin as a little boy. All the way down to Revenge of the Sith, he's kind of sticking up for the droids. Yeah. And then he becomes the evil guy. So, yeah. like, what does I that don't tell know us? How to take any of that? <laughs> no. So, I don't think it's coherent. I th- no. like. I think much as I love the world, I think, and I mean, I guess this is where you're going with mm-hmm. this whole point. There is no coherent ethical through line, ethical or even thematic through line through even each of the trilogies. Even mm-hmm. each of the three movies and each of the trilogies do not manage a coherent. But the weird thing is they keep poking at the idea. I know. It keeps coming up. And then they just, you know, as if, ah, we're going to do it. Yeah. And then they don't. And or they weird. Or they completely undercut the things they've, yeah. you know, like the whole, you're going to free the slaves yeah. in the first prequel. Mm-hmm which is literally not just never played off, but it's the opposite of that. And then we're sort of given by the end of the prequels to understand that the Jedi are horrible, exploitative people Mm -hmm. who have, you know, and that's even the Clone Wars. We've Mm -hmm. been watching the Clone Wars, the final season, the animated series. And in it, they really, I mean, that that series is more ethically coherent Mm -hmm. than anything else in the Star Wars universe, as far as I'm concerned. But in that, they really dig into that the Jedi are an exploitative elitist group who don't follow up on their own ideals and absolutely benefit from a hierarchical structure that ignores the suffering of many. Mm -hmm. But I guess that's the, that's what knights are. Well, yeah. And I'm, so like there are coherent ways in which Mm -hmm. that's true, but the the plot lines and the the, the lines in the movie keep, you know, keep countering that. Because that's the other historical thing is, you know, how they portray a knight and, their commitment to, you know, all these kind of ideals, but also the fact that they're part of this hierarchical structure. Yeah. But the the other thing I think that this, this whole issue of this weird mishandling of the theme mm-hmm. of slavery is it's part of a larger theme of good and evil. Mm-hmm. Which obviously is at the heart of all of these movies, but confusedly. And it's sort of many of the films, though not all of them, ask the question, is there absolute good and evil? Yeah. Right? Yeah. Is I there mean, a black and a white? Even though like the the imagery of all the movies is all about black and white. Mm-hmm. Very literally. And in the first, the very first film, I mean, it's very, it's a very simple yeah. morality. There is good One, and there is evil. There's bad guys and they blow up planets. Yeah. There's good guys and they don't. Yeah. <laughs> Very straightforward, yeah. And then as the the series goes on, especially when you get to the prequels, mm-hmm. it really problematizes this yeah. binary of good and evil. Yeah. And particularly in episode eight of the new yeah. trilogy, it really casts doubt on this idea of good and evil by pointing out that both the First Order and the Resistance are buying their weapons yeah, from the same, same sources yeah, yeah. and you know who is really good and and evil here yeah and then but they but even in that movie itself they don't follow up on that no right they have this amazing set piece in the middle mm-hmm. that looks like it's going to question the whole structure mm-hmm. of the galaxy well it seemed like it was setting it up then could that it could be then answered later in the it, next it, film but but even so like and they, they're like, who are the heroes? And can you really trust the heroes? And and they're setting up this oppressed group and this idea of the 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 glitterati who yeah. who ride it out and always win no matter what. No matter what else happens, they are always the ones who win. Mm-hmm. And they have an amazing, like, cathartic scene mm-hmm. of destroying the town. Plus, and it comes to nothing. It doesn't come to nothing in that movie and it comes to nothing, as you, mm-hmm. you're saying, in this movie yeah. either. Totally Plus, ignored. it undercut the idea of the individual hero, right? Yeah. Heroism isn't the act of 
one yeah. brave person who saves the day. In fact, true heroism is a broad understanding of context and everything else. And, and a it's, collective, action of, it's a it's collective, a collective yeah, action, yeah. right? Am I misremembering? Rose is in, not in the ninth movie at all. She is, but She's, very brief scenes. She has like a scene, right? She or has two? a few scenes, yeah. but you know, just a few yeah. lines here and, and there. And, and she's so central to that story of yes. what is wrong mm -hmm. with the world. Yeah. And that's just written right out. Yeah. Yeah. yeah and all, all of the stuff. And I know lots of people disliked the eighth movie yeah. for lots of reasons to do with that. But I mean, I adored the way what's his face Poe mm -hmm. was wrong. Mm -hmm. Just loved it. <laughs> And then they totally discard that because mm -hmm. Ray acts just like him. Yeah. She's just doing what she's going to do. She goes out to the Death Star without telling anybody. You know, she's totally, she's not following any, anybody's orders. She's not doing what anybody tells her to do. She's just doing what she thinks is right. And now suddenly that's heroic and great. Yeah. Well, and I mean, that's the way the Jedi have always, that's the way Luke always well, sort of functioned, that he was, he had a higher responsibility. That's how he functioned. It wasn't how the Jedi functioned. That's very no. much in the prequels, right? I mean, that's what Anakin fights against in the prequels mm -hmm. is the Jedi are like, no, we have a council and we do things according to rules and you do things. And that's the big tension of the end of the that the prequel trilogy mm -hmm. is the Jedi council telling him what to do and him not wanting to do it and thinking they're wrong, mm -hmm. but having no mechanism for getting around that. Whereas in the original series, there is no Jedi council. So no. L Luke can act he has access to knowledge that nobody else has so he can act on that. Mm -hmm. But that's... But I mean, you could say that about the new trilogy is that there's no Jedi Council. No, but Rey there is... Rey is acting on but there is a, there is some special maybe, insight. Maybe Rey is, but Poe isn't, right? Because no. he doesn't have special insight and those people do know about the Jedi and they know, like, they're yeah. not ignorant of it. So, yeah. I will never not enjoy the Star Wars movies. I want this to be really clear. This sounds like it's a trashing of them <laughs> and it's not i really enjoy them all I, I enjoy them let me get on the cards on the table here i enjoy rise of skywalker too mm -hmm. i don't hate any of these but it is frustrating how incoherent they are they're incoherent as movies and i don't mean incoherent in plot though they have, there's some problems with that in rise of skywalker too but i mean incoherent in message mm -hmm. and in theme and it is frustrating because while I don't want to declare myself a Jedi by religion, I do want, you know, a, a story that's all centered on good and evil. It feels like it should tell me what good is and what evil is well, or tell me that they aren't or whatever. Yeah. But it should yeah, yeah. it should have a message at the end of this huge saga and this about is, good and evil. This is the thing is that all the way back from, I guess, at least The Empire Strikes Back. Mm -hmm. The question was sort of posed either explicitly or implicitly, were the Jedi wrong about their whole yeah. stance and attachment yeah. and all of yeah. that, right? Yeah. And should should the Jedi just pass? And that that finally becomes very explicit mm -hmm. in episode eight, where Luke says, No, let the Jedi go. There's no point for them anymore. They are not important. And and Yoda says the same, right? If Yoda says it's right, then we think it's right too. And when he says to Luke, no. We don't need these books. It's all good. Let it go. We think, okay, that's a real thing. And it's, and in fact, it, you know, at the end of episode eight, it's not even, I mean, it starts off with Luke being very pessimistic and angry, mm -hmm. but he, he's not, he he's maintains not... that position, but in a more positive sense, yeah. or at least that's what, what Ray gets out of it is that well, it doesn't matter. Leia, and that's what Leia gets too. Yeah. Right at the end. Now, I guess in a sense, episode nine does give us an answer. Luke says he was wrong. Yeah. And all the Jedi sort of, you know, in their spirit form, line up behind Rey mm -hmm. and save the universe from all the Sith spirits lined up behind the Emperor. And it becomes that simple black and white question again. Yeah, it's so disappointing. It really is. And the idea that suddenly she is all the Jedi when last movie, the whole point is she wanted to be a Jedi and he said, no, you need to be something more than a Jedi, better than a Jedi. Mm -hmm. You know, the Jedi were wrong. They made a whole bunch of stupid errors. They were arrogant. They they thought they knew the answers. And for that to be completely discarded and mm -hmm. turned around into, 
hey, all you need is all the Jedi. Mm -hmm. But but it, it almost it, it's so annoying because it only needs a couple of tweaks because in a sense, what you could you could have had the same idea of like all the Jedi, mm -hmm. but her saying rather than being this vessel, this empty vessel who's in whose selfhood doesn't matter because that's what's really frustrating at the end. It doesn't matter who she is. Mm -hmm. It matters that she has the Jedi behind her. If instead it was a more about well, you, you could say it's about her choice. Yeah, but you could. Right. But but if it, if at the end instead it was to say, I, I am going to transcend Luke, who rejected the Jedi, and I am going to instead understand that the Jedi have value and created an important thing, but I understand in my sort of next step that they are not. They didn't have the final answer and that the final answer is, in fact, not being arrogant and not thinking I know everything. So I can now, like, call on the strength of Jedi past to move into a new future that is beyond the Jedi. Mm -hmm. Like, I don't think it, it would have been almost the same scene. It would have been Ray saying, I have learned from Luke's rejection of the Jedi and Kylo Ren's rejection of the Jedi and my own desire to be part of the Jedi. I've learned that these are like balanced things that have to be, because that's, you know, that would feel very Star Wars, right? There's mm -hmm. a balance here, a balance between the, the value of the past and an understanding that the arrogance of thinking you knew all the answers was a problem. Take the strength of the Jedi in the past, but move forward in a new way. And I, I mean, they could have done that, but they could have had a d d new weapon or she could have found a new power, you know, not force lightning, not, I'm not a film writer, but you know, mm. something like that, right? That's something that somehow synthesized, maybe even something that did what has been, we were told all through the other trilogies of like combining Sith and Jedi, like finally finding some kind of balance point instead of it just coming to, oh, well, I guess we just have to completely destroy and kill everybody who's Sith so that only the good side survives which totally ruins the whole point of the first two trilogies too, which is all this mm -hmm. idea that there's a sort of inevitable balance. You can't have the yin without the yang. Mm -hmm. That's like, I find that really frustrating because it, it was so close. Mm -hmm. And then it just sort of fell back on a kind of storytelling cliche. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. So anyways, that's my opening screed mm -hmm. in terms of just purely on the basis of the movies and their own narrative mm -hmm. logic and all of that. Mm -hmm. Well, I've kind of given a bunch of my thoughts and we've talked about about you know, we're like an hour in already, almost. So do you want to talk about the questions you have or do you want me to, shall I like talk a little bit about some of the epic tropes and interesting connections I see to sort of. Well, let me state the questions and not answer them. Okay. So first, because at least one of these questions is going to interrogate the sort of classical foundations of all of this. So first of all, is the Skywalker saga a saga mm -hmm. in particular, is it a family saga in old Norse terms? Is it a saga of the Icelanders kind of essential structure? And the question that I would ask there then is do the plots of the Norse family sagas discuss matters of great import? Mm -hmm. Are they or about are they how just, to be human or are they about like, this is what happened to my family? I mean, indirectly they kind of address human universal fears and concerns I mean, and that sort of thing. That every story does. But they don't tell the stories of kings and nations, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. They tell the stories of families. Mm -hmm. Not, I mean, some families are kings and nations, but these are not. But these are not. These, the people, the Icelanders were, it was not They're a kingdom. and stuff. Yeah. Well, and it was, it was not a kingdom. There was no king. It was a democracy. Mm -hmm. And it's not within the purview, at least of the sagas, that it ceases to become a democracy. On the other hand, is it an epic in the classical sense mm -hmm. of, you know, Greek and Roman epic, which are matters of great import. Mm -hmm. They are, they decide the fate of nations. They decide the fate of kingdoms mm -hmm. and great people. Mm -hmm. And so we can also compare both of these to, you know, the saga structure and the classical epic mm -hmm. structure. And there are, you know, in our previous yeah, podcast that's, episodes that's about that we've been addressed in, address these in particular in the the force, uh, force awakens. awakens we talked about this so now that we have the full nine films what we, can we say about it yeah. you know did is our was our prediction you know right or wrong you're suggesting i remember our prediction <laughs> <laughs>
And then there's, there is the other possibility that there is some element of romance mm. as a genre here. And there were Norse romances. And what you mean by romance is not like rom-com. Not you a romance novel. You mean the novel sort of episodic or, yeah. uh, adventure Like a medieval stories. romance. Yeah. A medieval romance, like the King Arthur stories. Yeah. And there, there were even Norse romances in the, in the later stuff. And there are even some hybrid forms. So there are some, one in particular saga that the first three quarters of it, maybe, or, or maybe two thirds are, is a family saga in structure. And then there's this long coda at the end, which is very much a romance. Mm -hmm. So is it blending genres like that? And then finally, I guess the other issue is all the question about family mm -hmm. that we discussed already and the importance of genealogy in Norse sagas, particularly family sagas, where it is kind of telling the story of generations over several time periods. So those are the questions that I have. I mean, my very broad answer is I think the incoherence we've just talked about is key to saying it's really hard to say any of, you know, to answer any of those questions mm -hmm. because to have, and you know, I'm, we're mean, I'm, I'm saying this as very much as a criticism. Mm -hmm. On the other hand, these are movies that span what, three, four decades, five, 1977. So to 17 is four decades. So like four and a half decades and obviously a bunch of different writers, bunch of, you know, like, so, to ask for coherence from that is asking a big thing. And to be fair, I mean, the the first six movies were auteur productions. And then the last three are the not. The last three are not. But the first six movies aren't coherent either. So, no. yeah. Lucas doesn't get it out on that. <laughs> <laughs> I think they were more coherent, though. I'm, I, I well, will make the argument except that, that I think the, the first... big problem of, of the, the, the recent trilogy mm -hmm is it didn't have a guiding... No, I, I I would agree with that. But I would say also that the prequels retcon a ton of stuff that's in... And I don't just mean in little pieces. I mean in terms of like suddenly bringing up the slavery stuff and then dropping the slavery stuff. Bringing up black and white as not the binary that it, we thought it was and then like not really carrying that through. And, you know, like there's a, they bring a bunch of stuff up and then they kind of drop it. Though so I, I would say, say in defense are, of in the coherent. prequels, they're probably as a set of three films, the most coherent. I would, Yeah, I think that's true. I think they are utterly let down by their scripts and it's really frustrating because I think they have really good ideas and they're beautiful mm -hmm. and they have the stupidest dialogue in the entire world which makes it impossible for the actors to produce good acting. Yeah, Lu Lucas probably should have taken his sort of draft and then given it to somebody who knew how to write dialogue. Yeah, yeah, no, and and okay, we're not we're not dealing with those. That said, uh, I agree those three are pretty coherent, but they aren't. They don't fit as well with the original three as you would want them to. And then th there's been definite problems with coherence. Okay, so that said, it's hard to answer your questions because. You can kind of come up with an answer that's several different answers and find, you know, mm -hmm. you can, you can show your work to prove mm -hmm. most of them. If you just cherry pick your scenes, sometimes within yeah. the same movie. So what I will do then to sort of start answering those is I will talk about some of the stuff because my eye moves naturally to Epic mm -hmm. because that's what I know best. So let me talk about some of the things that I saw that are Epic these are not like, you know, what are the big picture things that make it an epic? Well, it's about the fate of nations and worlds. Mm -hmm. It's about the fate of a galaxy. So on that level, like you just said, definitely epic, not saga. Mm -hmm. It, while it lacks coherence, it's attempting for coherence, which I mean, I think is not a romance. Mm -hmm. There's a, a goal, a narrative coherence, at there's least theoretically. Plot. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, yeah. There's a, there's an overarching plot, mm -hmm. which means it's not really like a romance mm -hmm. that said that can be elements of all those things. But so I think in its entirety as a nine movie thing, mm -hmm. and we're leaving aside all the, you know, rogue one and solo and stuff, but as those nine movies, I think it's an epic or an epic cycle mm -hmm. because it is dealing with huge questions. You know, the galaxy is different. It is wars on a scale hitherto unimaginable, et cetera, et cetera. That has to be epic. There's no real other 
what else could you compare it to? Right. Now, the fact that it has families in it, you could argue, so do all epics. I mean, they're all about families and family obligations and family inheritances as well. But do they cover a time frame across generations? They generally well, don't. Well, the epic cycle does. And I think that would be the thing to say. So epic, like the Iliad doesn't. Mm -hmm. The epic cycle, which does not survive. So to people who don't know what I'm talking about, when we talk about the epic cycle, we're talking about a whole series of epics that went from at least the story of Peleus and Thetis, the parents of mm -hmm. Achilles, and the wedding at which the apple of discord was thrown that produced the judgment of Paris, blah, mm -hmm. blah, 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 blah. From at least that period, all the way to past the Odyssey of many returns from Troy. I don't know all of the details mm -hmm. of it, which ones they were, but there were also epics about the seven against Thebes and the first siege of Troy, which yeah. happened to the, that was the generation of Heracles. But they're so not considered part of the same cycle. Are no, they? but, but they are the point being, there's a huge interconnected series or there were a mm -hmm. huge interconnected series. I mean, no, they maybe don't have quite as many generations, but the whole scope of mythology does definitely cover all those yeah. generations. And you have episodic, you know, if we're going to talk about nine movies, that's nine poems. If I were going to mm -hmm. make a connection to a classical, you could definitely find nine poems that went that far. Mm -hmm. well, I, I mean, I guess you could say loosely, well, first of all, there are Icelandic sagas that mm -hmm. in a single saga covers over, yeah. many generations. But, you know, to say nine poems, like nine movies shouldn't be one poem. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> you know, as a I, parallel. I mean, the other thing you can say is that the collection of, well, not that they were ever thought of as a collection, but all of the, yeah. it's like, there is interconnect, people are mentioned in, in multiple, multiple sagas, places. Yeah. And yeah. So I, I don't think, like, I, I guess my point is, I don't think it's really useful. I mean, none of these screenwriters mm -hmm. was sitting down and being like, I am going to do exactly the epic yes. cycle. Right. No. So it's not really useful to try to, no, no. to say this is only this or only that. Fair enough. So on that level, I will say there are many things about it that are epic. Mm -hmm. And I would say that the people constructing the story probably were thinking in epic terms often, mm -hmm. not exclusively about, yeah, the scope, you know, and epics are about of gods and men, there are no gods in the Star Wars world, but you can very definitely say that the Jedi play that role, mm -hmm. right? Like they are the supernatural. They're the certainly force, a supernatural. And yeah. the, force the force is itself this, is maybe is, the god. Is like a god. There's mm -hmm. this idea, or the force is like fate, mm -hmm. and the Jedi are the ones who are enacting fate or trying to mm -hmm. follow the dis the dictates of fate, and they have this supernatural ability that They're raises the them above. Yeah, that raises them above mm -hmm. regular people. So, you know, you can make those kinds of parallels. Um, and then there's on a, on a sort of more granular level, just looking at this movie in particular, mm -hmm. you know, there are things like the, the epic cycle is filled with prophetic requirements, things that mm -hmm. are prophecies like for Troy to fall, you have to have, and this is the epic cycle. It's not in the Iliad, but mm -hmm. for Troy to fall in the epic cycle, you have to have the bow of Heracles. You have to have the son of Achilles has to come. You have to get the palladium. You have to steal the palladium from Troy. You have like, there's like seven or eight different requirements that mm -hmm. have to be fulfilled. And at various points, some prophet will tell you mm -hmm. or some Oracle will tell you, you have to have those in order for Troy to fall. Well, the Sith wayfinders mm -hmm. are a very much a MacGuffin like that, right? Mm -hmm. Like you have to find the Sith wayfinders or else you aren't going to be able to fight the final battle. So <laughs> I wrote down the MacGuffins that must be found before the final boss battle, mm -hmm. which like it really does feel at moments like it is just a video game. Right. Like, okay, go here, go here, go here, mm -hmm. do this, press that, see this, get that. Okay. Mm -hmm. Collect this, collect that moving on. And there's tons of, in the epic cycle. We're like that. Mm -hmm. Like the Iliad wasn't, but tons of the one, other ones that don't survive. We have the, they were totally like that. Now in the earlier really both earlier trilogies, there was a prophecy surrounding a person, yeah. the chosen one and bringing balance to the force. Yeah. But that prophecy. Was that there at all in any of the new films? I'm, I can't. <sighs> no, I don't feel like it was. I don't feel like it's ever picked up on. And I, I think that's one of the frustrations. And that's sort of what I mean about like, I think Ray's final apotheosis, because mm -hmm. that's what she has, right? She has a moment of becoming divine. Mm -hmm. 
I think it could have culminated all of those things, and it, it doesn't. All it does is make the line between the four, the Jedi and the Sith an irrevocable, uncrossable line. Mm-hmm. Doesn't make any sense. But yeah, that those prophecies in the first two sets of trilogies, though, are very much like the nebulous kind of prophecy that you don't understand until it's fulfilled. Right. Whereas the idea that there's a prophecy about, because she finds the book, right? Ray right. finds the book. She's like, there's a prophecy about these, there's like information about these things I have to find. Mm-hmm. And I, I think Luke was going to figure it out. And I'm, I, I think I figured it out now. That kind of prophecy where you might not fully understand it, but it's definitely telling you a task you have to do. Mm-hmm. That's a very epic cycle thing. Right. And, you know, here's the thing. You have to go and get this item. And if you don't get this item, you won't succeed. Mm-hmm. And so I thought that was a point. So, I mean, the other thing that that seems to be a real key element of the way that a plot moves in those kinds of epics is that there is this sense of fate, as you were saying. Yeah. Yeah. And certainly that kind of fate stuff is there in, again, the two earlier trilogies. Mm-hmm. Is there any kind of operation of fate then in the the new trilogy and particularly the, the yeah, last film? Yeah, I, I, I think the I think the stuff at the end where it's all of the people come together and they have this dyad of the force, that feels like they're picking up on the idea of fate. Hmm. They were fated to get to this point. But you're right, it isn't it isn't highlighted the same way it is earlier. And in the earlier movies, you know, Palpatine seems to sort of understand what right. will happen. This is what as must, I've foreseen it. I've foreseen saying. it and it must happen this way and you can do whatever you want, but whatever you want will lead you. You know, it's the self-fulfilling prophecy thing right. of it doesn't matter what you know or what you think you're trying to fight against. It's going to lead you to the same place no matter what. Mm-hmm. But then, of course, he keeps failing. Right. Mm-hmm. Like he's wrong. Every time in the end, he's right and right and right and right and right. And then at the last moment, Mm -hmm. except in uh, the final prequel Mm -hmm. where he's ascendant, but he's, you know, he's eventually wrong Mm -hmm. in the second trilogy. Yeah, I I, I think it's one of the, uh, again, one of the points that, well, I'll get to that in a moment. Let me just point out some of the other things that were sort of epic-like. Epics have Aristea, which are moments of bestness. Right. So one of the things you have in an epic is because most epics are martial in some form, mm-hmm. you have fighters having their moment of glory right. where they show off their excellence. They show off the things that make them a hero. And I will say that I think in Rise of Skywalker, we have that with Rey. Mm-hmm. We have that in the ship sequence. You know, like that's a moment of just pure sort of her perfection as a force user. And yet that that engagement ends with her believing she yeah, killed a Conrad. Friend, yeah. You know, that is an extreme, it's, it's, she, it's such she, an extreme use of force that even Kylo yeah. Ren is shocked she can do it. Yeah. So that is her Aristea. But an Aristea doesn't always like, it's excellence in, it shows the strength you have. Mm-hmm. Well, and I mean, doesn't that's, necessarily mean it's good. Yeah. And that's often an element, I guess, with classical mm-hmm. heroes is mm-hmm. that they're, they're very, their excellence their is not excellence necessarily is morally sometimes good. dangerous. Yeah. So Achilles Aristea involves him fighting a river, slaughtering, like it's horrifying. It is to, I think, genuinely to anybody, even an ancient Greek, he is a force of nature and he is murderous and it's terrifying. It shows what he is, where he is extreme and where he is excellent. But that doesn't mean you would want to be like that or be around it or that it wasn't terrifying. And he, he breaks the bounds of nature. He goes beyond what a human should do. Diomedes Aristea is so extreme that he ends up wounding, wounding Aphrodite, gods, yeah. you know, like it's more than anyone should mm-hmm. do. So an Aristea isn't necessarily, and that's like, that's an important point of mm-hmm. ancient heroism. Mm-hmm. Heroism in the ancient world is not comfortable or wholesome, mm-hmm. right? There's no Captain America right. in the ancient world of heroes. They, when they protect you, it's great, but it's still scary and they don't always protect you. And so I think an Aristea in its purest form is not necessarily about goodness. It's about Mm -hmm. excellence. Ray shows in that scene, her extreme ability with the force, but that in itself, I mean, and I think it's very meaningful in that scene that she uses force lightning, Mm -hmm. which we have only ever seen associated with evil. Mm -hmm. 
So she uses it. She has that capacity. It shows the extremity of her abilities, but it doesn't have a good result. Mm -hmm. In the end, it's okay. But though apparently we're okay with the fact it killed lots of people as long as it didn't kill Chewie. <laughs> well, I don't know that we've ever up to that point seen anyone use force lightning to destroy a ship. Yeah. So she is exhibiting mm -hmm. her special ability, which mm -hmm. is an extreme force ability. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I had written down the balance between like the gods and the fate. The gods, even the gods have to follow the fates in Epic. Even Zeus has to do what fate has foretold. So even the Jedi have to bow to sort of the force and the prophecy. So I think there's this balance between gods and fate. The Emperor is so bad at persuasion and psychology. And he's done this ever since Return of the Jedi. He's always saying, yes, give in to the dark side, give in to your anger. And that always gives people the clue that they're like, oh, I shouldn't be angry. I must restrain myself. And he does the same thing in this one. He's like, he tells Ray, you and Kylo, you're going to do this. You're going to attack me. This is what's going to happen. Work with Anakin. It did work with Anakin, but it doesn't work with anybody else. And in this case, it's like the self-fulfilling prophecy mm. of much of myth, right? By telling them what will happen. It's sort of the reverse of that. It's a reverse of a self-fulfilling prophecy. He tells them what will happen and therefore it does not happen. Mm. So it's like, it's just a little flip of that. It just makes me laugh every time. One of the other scenes is the, the idea of the ghost of the father. Mm. So fathers and sons, right? Mm -hmm. Fathers and sons are huge in epic, Roman epic in particular, but Greek epic too. Big deal. So thinking of the Aeneid in particular, the Roman epic, the ghost of the father coming back as a guide telling you what to do. We've had the father figure in other movies, but here we have literally the father. Mm. So Han Solo coming back to tell Ben what to do. And then Ben chooses the right path because of the ghost of the father. And that's that's something, I mean, the, the sort of classical father-son mm. thing, something that's very different from the way it operates in Norse Saga. Mm. If anyone comes back from the dead in Norse Saga, it is unambiguously not good. Yeah, terrifying and horrifying. <laughs> yes. Yeah. yeah. Whereas this idea of ghosts... I mean, there is the influence of trying to live up descent. to your... Yeah, yeah, yeah. And you're often reminded of it by other relatives saying... Like you know, wives. A lot of wives, wives and sisters saying, and you know, mothers look, your, saying your, your father, father would have done this. And, yeah. why, why are you such a weak So there's that now. kind of reminder. But if anyone comes, if you see a spirit from beyond the grave, this is <laughs> bad, not bad, good. Bad, 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 yeah. Yeah, no. So that's that's a difference. Though the real locus classicus there is the going Aeneid. To the is the, well, and is the Aeneid going to the underworld and getting the advice from his father. Right. But even he also has a dream where Anchises comes to him and he has a dream where Hector comes to him. Like multiple people come to him in dreams and give him important advice. So that element of the ghost coming back is is really very Roman specifically, mm -hmm. though it may be pulling on sources we don't know from the Greek sources. And then I will say just to cut to your earlier points about the incoherence, like I'm going to read the point I wrote down while we were watching the movie. Incoherence of message, friendship, love. Jedi bad or good, family important or not, blood. <laughs> like it's exactly what you were talking about. So yes. we can talk, go on to the saga thing. I was so mad they made her Palpatine's granddaughter. Mm -hmm. Like what the hell? That surely was not what they were thinking when they were like, I feel like that's a change from she's nobody well, it's certainly a change from episode eight. That's what I'm saying. Like in, in episode eight, when but I it may do not have been what was intended in episode seven. Maybe, but I, um, I mean, they were certainly hinting heavily that, that there was, there was some issue about her. About her. Yeah. And I mean, admittedly her having no parents and stuff, you know, sets up, mm -hmm. but I loved what they did in eight where they were like, no, that doesn't matter. Her parents were just people who left her because the world is a complicated mm -hmm. and sometimes cruel place where people don't always come back and mm -hmm. things, you know, things go wrong and she's just a person. And then in nine, and especially at the end when she's like, I'm, my name's Ray Skywalker. Mm -hmm. It seems to just have reverted completely back to the only way you can be a hero is if you have the right DNA and you come from the right people. And if your race and your class and your family mm -hmm. isn't right, you can't be a hero. And I hate that. I've got to say, I really, it's very ancient. Don't get me wrong. Yeah. 
totally in keeping with the ancient world. I don't like it. But of course, it, it entirely depends on how you read the prequels, because Anakin was a nobody. His mother yeah. was a nobody. Yeah. But they, he starts a family that becomes basically Zeus slept with his mom. Right. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's essentially what we get. The force impregnated her. Mm -hmm. It might as well be a golden shower. Mm -hmm. And then from that point on, the House of Skywalker is the only force in the galaxy that matters. Now, again, as I say, this depends on how you read the sequels, because some people have, have taken it to be implied that really Palpatine is the sort of father of Anakin somehow you know, use the force. Manipulated the force to do that. Yeah. Well, in that case, it just makes it even more extreme. Mm -hmm. It's still, it's even more about like only one, only from one mm -hmm. person does all power descend. I just in find it. In which case, she is sort of a Skywalker or at least all the Skywalkers are Palpatines or whatever. Yeah, whatever. But none of that makes it better. I mean, I, no, no. ideologically, I think it's, I, I think it's vile, it frankly. I think it's just, I don't, I, I understand that that's, but... I, I understand that that's not, like this is very normal in fantasy and I, I don't mean that this is all about evil racism from like, you know, I know this is how fantasy works often, but I, you know, as soon as you start to pick it apart, what the hell message is that? Mm -hmm. It's but awful. again, you know, it is just drawing on because it's also the medieval thing, right? Oh, the yeah. farm boy who turns out to be. Absolutely. But that's kind of the difference between fairy tales and folk and tales. Folk tale. yeah. Well, yeah, fairy tales and folk tales, because that's more the folk tale. Yeah, that's a folk tale story. The yeah. folk hero yeah. is is it's genuinely just nobody, a nobody. But he's clever, and yeah. so he, yeah. No, absolutely. And and from that perspective, it is very classical, as I said. Mm -hmm. You know, nobody in classical mythology is ever a nobody. <laughs> They're always connected somehow to somebody. It's also... It's the romance tradition. It's the romance tradition. And in many ways, even though you're not talking about kings, it is the saga story, like you were saying descent and lineage is very important in Icelandic it's important, sagas. Though, I mean, you frequently see descendants not living up to yeah. But that they're whatever. expected to, that's the point. The idea that blood has power, mm -hmm. that family lineage matters. It's but, important, uh, but not a determiner. No, but it's, no, it's, it doesn't determine your state, but the idea is that when a generation doesn't live up to its family, the whole point is that blood should make the difference, but doesn't for this generation. Mm -hmm. And then it will be redeemed by the next generation. So the underlying so I don't assumption know, still I don't is there. I don't know if the assumption was that it's causal or that it's a question of, do you try and live up to that for the sake of honor? Right. Yeah. And it's what you do that matters. Yeah. But the people who, will manage to achieve great deeds are very rarely not of some sort of lineage. I think there are some sort of the, the peripheral characters who are not of, you know, particularly notable birth who end up being loyal and, you know, heroic and noteworthy and those things. Loyal, it does... and, loyal and noteworthy, mm -hmm. but not the main characters. Not the main character, maybe. But yeah, I... I mean, that's, uh, you know, if you're going to do a family saga, you're going to do it mm -hmm. about your family. So obviously the members of your family are going to be the notable characters, right? Like there's yeah. a, a circular logic to that. So mm -hmm. uh, no, I, I don't think the Icelandic sagas are as focused on that element as some of these others, mm -hmm. but it's there. So to say that Star Wars cares about family lineage just puts it in this tradition. Mm -hmm. So I will, you know, granted that they're hardly different on that, but I still find it disappointing. And I, I, I'm not surprised it's there in the first trilogy. And I understand why the prequels double down on it. But when the sequels seemed to be breaking the mold, I was so excited. Mm -hmm. And for them to then come back to, oh, no, she's actually a Palpatine. Not that we ever get explained I mean, how she, she is a Palpatine. A Skywalker somehow. <laughs> I don't like the emphasis on blood. Hmm. And it didn't bother me as much in the original series, in the original trilogy. But I was so disappointed that they didn't follow through on breaking that emphasis from eight to nine. Well, I think we're very agreed on the fact that seven, eight, and nine do not hang together. No. They just don't, they aren't saying, like, is friendship a good thing or is it a bad thing? Like Finn being left behind on the Death Star in nine, for instance. His devotion to Rey yeah. 
that whole like it, it it seems to be building up to this like really important friendship. The fact that she and Poe and he are friends is like key to why they will succeed, just like it was in right. in uh, A New Hope. Right. And she has a freak out and leaves. And she never even sees him. Well, she does see him because she throws him back with the force. So she knows he's there. Yeah, like, but she doesn't like as but far she just, as she, she, she couldn't care less. She couldn't She's care totally less. uninterested in him. Nothing he does affects whether or not she succeeds. No. He is not important to it. So in the original trilogy, their friendship, and you know, that's the important point on, on Dagobah, oh, yeah, right? Like, absolutely. I have to save my friends yeah. is 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 this key thing in contradistinction to what the Jedi think. Oh yeah. The the friendship bond between Luke, mm -hmm. Leia, and Han is, is, is much it, more And even Lando, like and Chewie, like everybody and yeah. the droids, right? Like it's there. And it's not only powerful, but we we are told it is the thing that makes the them actually successful. Yeah. Well, yeah. not just motivates. It's, it's what yes. makes them successful. They succeed because they are friends, not yes. in spite of being friends. Yes. And that is what seemed to be, you know, in nine, it seems to be building that up. The, the po Oh yeah. And it's that completely wonderful, irrelevant. In, and, it's and, but completely in that irrelevant. wonderful scene at the beginning when they arrive and yeah. like back see Ray and they seem so like mm -hmm. a team. But totally, the fact that she succeeds has nothing to do with Poe and Finn. I know. And that, Finn. that's, a, yeah. that, my, that's my point. It, is it's that entirely it's about another, the relationship she's built up with Kylo. Yeah. It's yet another place in mm -hmm. which they've, they just totally undercut any message they had in a previous mm -hmm. movie or even in, in the movie itself. And the thing is, it's and all, I think that's, it I think is that's all kind really of, bad writing. It, it is all kind of built up in seven. Yeah. Right. In that their friendship does matter and it Absolutely does save matter. things. It does. And, 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 and an eight. And an eight. And an eight. Because yeah. like Rose and, mm -hmm. and Finn become really important. Mm -hmm. like, and, and the, the connections in, in that final battle. Yeah. So, all, all of this is me just saying that's what's really frustrating is that I think these these good pieces, but I don't in the end understand is friendship important? Mm -hmm. Is friendship not? Which is why I think my my reaction to nine is maybe more negative than yours is that there's just a few little set pieces that are more fan service than anything else that are kind of enjoyable just as a scene. Mm -hmm. But the film as a whole is not. Well, my positive doesn't reaction, give me a positive reaction. Uh, my positive reaction, as I said earlier to you, like over mm -hmm. dinner, is just that you put me in that world and you give me those characters. Mm -hmm. I'm not going to hate it. I don't no. really care what you do with them. Even if you do mm -hmm. stupid things that make me annoyed, I'm still going to rather watch that than not. Mm -hmm. Like, I don't I don't have a hatred reaction in me for that kind of a movie. So I don't hate it. Mm -hmm. I don't even have an overwhelmingly negative reaction to it, but I do feel as we move through it, I get grumpy about a bunch of stuff mm -hmm. all the way through. End result, it's still a Star Wars movie. I like watching Star Wars movies. I have a very small C Catholic approach to that. Like mm -hmm. you can do mostly anything and I'm still going to be like, yeah, I still like watching these people do these things in this world. But I agree. It's bad narrative. It's bad narrative structure. It's bad plot writing. And it's really bad ethics mm -hmm. and bad ethics, both because it's bad. I actually just do genuinely think people are redeemed for no reason. And that's bad, but also it's ethically bad in the sense it's just incoherent. It doesn't know what it like. If it wants to say the messages, friendship isn't as important. Fine. Say that. But it doesn't even say that. It just mm -hmm. does. It has no idea from scene to scene. It does not know what its message is. And I think that's really not good. And it's frustrating because I think there's like great acting in it, wonderful visuals, you know, all of those pieces that you know are good. Like people do great stuff in it. I really like Ray. Mm -hmm. I like Ray the whole way, even when she's being an idiot and caring about Kylo. Anyway. So how should the the last trilogy have gone? Like in the absence of all three of them, was there <sighs> any way to, to make this work? I don't know. It's easy to critique. It's hard to write. Yeah. Let me be blunt about that. But I suppose what you can say is, I suppose the one thing you can say is they shouldn't have made them. That it was, it was coherent with six films. No, and but you, you know, you could say that, but like, I loved Force Awakens mm -hmm. and I really enjoyed eight too. I'm not sad. Those are in the world. I'm not even sad. Mm -hmm. The rise of Skywalker is in the world. I don't think it, it doesn't undermine, you know, Later movies do not destroy earlier movies. No, and, but I mean, you could have done them like 
Solo and yeah. Rogue One, where they were yeah, not, I I do they think didn't try they didn't to have to be so beholden to it. Yeah, I don't even mind that. I just I think if you were going to make them, mm-hmm. then sit down before you make all three movies and sketch out your story. And I don't even care which story it was. Mm-hmm. It could have been a story that went on to say the Jedi were right, attachment is wrong. Let's all be Zen. Mm-hmm. It could have been that, mm-hmm. right? Like I might not have liked that message but I could have lived with it. It could have been a story that said friendship is all the Jedi were wrong. Like, I don't care what the story is, but figure that out. Just decide what your message is. Make it make sense with the first two trilogies and say, whatever you do with each individual movie, it's got to fit this. It has to tell this story. Mm -hmm. That's what I think the big mistake was. And I don't, I think there were lots of different ways they could have gone. Like each of the movies gives us glimpses of different storylines that would have worked, uh-huh. but they're all together. <laughs> like that doesn't make any sense. That's what's frustrating about it. And it doesn't work. And so I don't mind that they made them. I, and I don't mind that they were different in tone like that. I think would have been okay too. give a different director, you know, mm-hmm. to each of them. I don't think that one necessarily mattered. They as just, long as the script they was. needed. They needed a through line that Mm -hmm. says, you know, here are the beats we're going to hit each movie. We aren't even going to tell you what the plot is, but, you know, the end point of the movie has to be friendship saves the day or the end point of the movie has to be attachment matters or the end point of the movie has to be black and white are not all there is. People are more complicated than that. Whatever. You know, here are the four moral principles of this (laughs) of this movie. Of this movie franchise. Because people have always treated Star Wars like that. Mm -hmm. Like it has moral principles. Well, embrace that. Here are the like three or four points. Don't deviate from those. Right? Whatever plot you damn well please. Just make sure you hit these points. Mm -hmm. I guess the the thing I'm asking is more in terms of the structure and and what we were talking about. It's it's connection Mm -hmm. to ancient and medieval. Story uh, structures. Story structures. And... You know, is there a way to have another? Well, so there's two different things. One is you do it as a full on family saga Mm -hmm. and you never tease that she's not part of that family and you just make it the next chapter. Mm -hmm. Another way you do it is to make it a romance to say, okay, we had family saga for two, two sets and Mm -hmm. now we're going to do romance. We're going to do episodic adventures. Which is kind of what Rogue One and. Yeah. But you yeah, could have done that. Or... You could have done that even still within the same sort of mm-hmm. overall arc. And then you would have sort of said, okay, we won't give you those four moral structures. We'll just be like, do whatever you want, mm-hmm. but and, don't try to tie it all up. And just so not the further adventures of, you know, and not bring back the whole Palpatine. No, exactly. Not give us the same people again. Just be like, us... Hey, we've set up a world. We've set up the rules of that world. Mm-hmm. This is how things work in this world. We're going to do some more adventures. They can have people who are related because we can't, it makes us care about them, mm-hmm. but they're just going to go on and have their world. And it's not going to all tie neatly together. It's just going to be more stories. That would have been fine. Could have been an, an epic, but like, I think the epic and the family saga both demand coherence. Mm-hmm. You know, the Icelandic family sagas don't necessarily always have a through line or a moral story because no. they're based on, to some yeah. extent, actual History. real people yeah. who did real things and real people are not coherent. So in that sense, it's true. But like, yeah, but, and in, in particularly in the earlier yeah. sagas of the Icelanders, they, they're not as literary. Yeah. The later ones probably more mold like that, yeah. the actual events into more of a yeah. plot, but. But, but the thing is, if that's what you're doing, then you don't pick up Palpatine and et cetera, et cetera, right? Like if you're going to just be like, here's what people are like, mm-hmm. then you don't have all these resonances and echoes and re- repeating stories and Palpatine coming back. I mean, Palpatine coming back really is. Yeah, I thought that was really cheap. To be I, yeah, I, I really think it, it. If they had done it really carefully and made it pay off something something like made it be the thing that like capped the basic moral messages of the first two trilogies Mm -hmm. about the seductiveness of evil versus the importance of friendship or something i don't know then maybe but as it was all it was was just like oh we can't think of another big bad i guess we'll just have a big bad who's the guy we already had Mm -hmm. 
we had him in the first two trilogies, so I guess we have him in the third because otherwise, what's the symmetry to it? Mm -hmm. You know, and it doesn't feel like there was any. And all he was was a like a demon mm -hmm. at the end. Yeah, he didn't really have personal motivation. So no, much. all he cared about was like, oh, I'm gonna put my soul in you so my granddaughter can be mean. Well, and he, <laughs> I think he would have been perfectly fine if she had just been evil and just yeah. decided to carry on, and then he probably could have just faded into the background. Yeah, all he wanted was people to be evil. Mm -hmm. In the first two trilogies, he wanted power. Mm -hmm. Fine, that's what villains want. But in this one, what he wanted was people to be mean to other people. Not even himself being mean, just like people in general should be mean to other people. Like it, it was not a, it, it didn't even have the force of like a personal motivation. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So... I don't know. We have talked about this a long time and only a certain amount of it is technically relevant to the themes of our podcast. <laughs> a lot of it was just ranting about Star Wars. I think we should call an end to this. Okay. I do think, I mean, just to sort of defend the makers of that movie. Yeah. I think they had an impossible task. Yeah. But the first given, two movies set them up to an impossible yes. task. Yeah. So given that, I mean, seven and eight, which were both great movies on their own, but it did not match. It set up something yeah. that couldn't be resolved. Yeah, I agree, and and I I like I can see the pieces of good ideas all through the movie. Mm -hmm. Just in the end, didn't come to that. Well, thanks for sticking with us through two hours of these are my annoying remarks about Star Wars. <laughs> I, I did no research other than watching the movie, so this is not the the fault of my over exuberant research no we just had a lot of opinions yes we will try to come back with something maybe a little more linguistic -y next time or who knows i have no idea as i said do tell us if you want us to talk about diseases or something else we're always open to suggestions we have other ideas too but right at this very moment i can't remember what they are so we'll be back soon. We hope you're all doing well uh, and either staying at home or opening up safely, depending on where you are, what's going on, or whether you can trust your government and a whole bunch of other things that we should probably not think too hard about. But be well, and thanks for listening. Bye-bye. For more information on this podcast, check out our website, www.alliterative.net, where you can find links to the videos, blog posts, sources, and credits, and all our contact info. And please check out our Patreon, where you can pledge to support this show and our video project. You can go directly to the videos at youtube.com slash alliterative. Our email is on the website, but the easiest way to get in touch with us is Twitter. I'm at Avensarah, A-V-E-N-S-A-R-A-H. And I'm at alliterative keep up with the podcast, subscribe on your favorite podcast app or to the feed on the website. And if you've enjoyed it, consider leaving us a review on Apple Podcasts or wherever you listen. It helps us a lot. We'll be back soon with more musings about the connections around us. Thanks for listening. Bye.